Today's show is brought to you by TraderCobb.com. Visit TraderCobb, C-O-B-B.com to go visit and join up to our free bi-weekly video newsletter. In the newsletter, you'll get two emails per week with content about the markets, scans, often heads up calls, and you can meet my apprentices. Join the website now and find out more about how you can get a structured trading approach and attack the markets with an idea of what you're doing. Join TraderCobb.com now. Trader, trade, trader, Cobb. crypto podcast. podcast. This is the Trader Cobb Crypto Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Trader Cobb Crypto Show. Another great guest with us today with some different perspectives and viewpoints from uh, a very scientific background. I'm really excited to have and uh, looking forward to bringing to you Christopher Sheetha, who is the founder of Ethereal Capital. So thank you so much for being with us today, Christopher. If you could um, just let the guys at home know uh, a bit of bit of background, if you could. Yes. Thank you, Trader Cobb. Um, so yeah, my name is Christopher Sheetha. I'm the um, founder of uh, Ethereal Capital. Um, so I've, I've been in the blockchain space since... Uh, uh, late 2013, um, basically, we, we started uh, 2013 uh, looking at uh, Bitcoin mining. Um, so this is just after the uh, just after the Mt. Gox incident. So we we set up a uh, a Bitcoin mining cluster in Iceland with uh, ten of the old uh, Spondulis Tech SP10 Bitcoin miners, which a lot of people would probably remember fairly fondly as those guys had some re- really, really nice equipment. Um, and then we got into Ethereum mining uh, around the middle of 2016, just before the uh, infamous Dow incident. Um, and then, um, yeah, since 2016, um, we, we deployed our own, uh, well, we basically built and deployed our own um, GPU mining systems in um, in Iceland initially um, and then expanded our operation into um, Canada uh, and most recently the USA. Um, so, yeah, we've had, we've had several years of experience mining both, both Bitcoin and Ethereum um, and a few other currencies. Uh, and prior to that, I was the... Um, Chief Technology Officer and Founder of uh, Cloud Central, which is a Australian managed secure infrastructure as a service provider. Uh, so I started that business back in 2010 uh, and eventually exited the business uh, via a trade sale in uh, March 2017. Uh, so I've got a got a strong infrastructure background as well as a information security uh, background. Yeah. That's, that's that's a basic introduction. So you've done quite a bit in this. I mean, you, you've been in the space for quite some time. You, you, you've obviously, um, I mean, look, look, reading your CV as such or your um, sort of LinkedIn profile, you, you've done a whole lot more than what you've just explained. Uh, you've been in the space for 20 years and you, you've done a huge amount across so many different areas. Um, now, what, what I'm interested in is, I mean, with that sort of background, with, with the amount that you've actually done and obviously getting started, why did you decide that it was a worthwhile endeavor to start mining Bitcoin back in 2013 when it was still relatively rinky dink unknown yeah whatever whatever type of thing but across most people most people had no idea what Bitcoin was and if you try to explain it to them myself included from trading back then I, I went yeah it's not really anything for me so what was it back then for you to have the vision to decide look I, I'm going to use the experience I've got my background in infrastructure and computing um, why was it then that you decided it would be a worthwhile activity to mine Bitcoin. So I, I saw Bitcoin uh, for the first time, and then I was, uh, was quite um, enamored with it. I guess uh, I, I did a lot of research, almost nonstop for um, three to four weeks. That sounds about normal. <laughs> being yeah, going down the uh, crypto rabbit hole, as they say. So yeah, I, I just saw it as a um, it's an excellent vehicle for um, taking back control of the um, economy by by people from the um, 
incumbent interests. And you started mining back then when, I mean, the hash rate was a much different proposition. The price was a much different proposition. I mean, it was a very different world back then. You could mine a lot more Bitcoin for a lot less. Now it's obviously expanded enormously uh, price-wise and use-wise. Um you know, from from where we are now, I mean, look, I, I spoke to uh, Andrew Kegel of Hut 8 Mining. He's got a big mining operation uh, running there out of uh, Alberta, Canada, I think it was. Uh, I think it is. And, um, I mean, he was discussing the difference between, you know, the hash rate and the price. So you used to have that the hash rate would um, would increase and the price would also increase. So it still made it worthwhile for you to, uh, to mine. What happens going forward if the hash rate increases continues to increase i.e you can't mine as much for the computing power and the price continues to fall will mining just die or will the price recover based on that well well mining won't mining won't die um effectively the the industrial scale miners that have access to the lowest um lowest power costs will inevitably be the last one standing so they'll they'll mine until they effectively reach the marginal cost of production um, and everyone else, the home miners will, um, and they already are, drop out prior to them. So, like, uh, I think Bitcoin's mineable until 2041 or something. So, Bitcoin mining won't die until they uh, change a proof of work algorithm. And um, considering the resistance to any changes in the in the Bitcoin core stack, I can't see that happening. Um, Ethereum, on the other hand, uh, as it's slated to transition to the proof of stake later in 2019, early 2020, um, it, it, it's obviously going away. So, you know, at that point, you're going to have a lot of uh, GPU miners looking to do something else with their equipment. And, and what do you think is the likely outcome of that? I mean, we, we're seeing the Ethereum price getting a, a fair bit of a beating this year. It's, I mean, let's be honest, it's probably had the biggest fall from grace as far as the top 10 goes. Actually, I think that's a pretty, I think that I think it's sort of undisputed that it's been the worst performing top 10 uh, cryptocurrency in the space. Now, with that being the case and the mining, you know, coming or coming away from mining for that, do, do you see that as being somewhat of uh, maybe creating the issue or do you, do you think miners might already be moving away from it at the moment, moving into other tokens? Or what, what's the eventual outcome of that with Ethereum? Oh, so, so miners are definitely already transitioning to mine other currencies like um, Ethereum Classic and Monero, for example. Um, and the ones with more expensive electricity are, are literally either switching their rigs off or switching them off and selling them on the um, on the secondary market. So, and they're very cheap at the moment. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a bit of a uh, bit of a, a liquidation bloodbath, I guess you could call it. Fire sale. Fire sale. Yeah. Um, okay, so look, with, with that in mind, I mean, look, we are seeing the space evolve. We are seeing the space change. I've got a good friend of mine who who were here in Sydney. He's talking about um, the, the optimizing of mining chips, um, allowing them to get a lot more out of it, you know, a lot more bang for your buck, which takes away the 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 requirement for cheap power to a certain extent where it used to be you know you have to go to you know some foreign country and get cheap electricity or set up shop next to a power plant or own a power plant um what sort of developments are we seeing in that space and will mining change significantly over the coming years do you think oh so so right now we're seeing the uh re-emergence of um fpgas in the mining space so uh an fpga is a field programmable gate array which is effectively a programmable integrated circuit. Um, so you've got you've got GPUs, which are graphics processing units, which are, which are not really optimised to mining. They're, they're optimised to 3D rendering and, and playing games. Uh, then you've got ASICs, which are application specific integrated circuits, and they're um, they're as the name implies, spe- specifically designed to be able to uh, do one thing and one thing only. So. Um, I mean, you've got you've got a bunch of um, players like um, Bitmain, for example, that have been releasing ASICs for algorithms such as uh, CryptoNight, which is used by Monero, uh, and Zcash. Um, but what we're what we're seeing is, you know, the developers 
and the, the mining community in general is fighting back against those ASICs by changing the proof of work algorithms to um, you know, effectively block those ASICs from the network. So the ASICs are seen as a uh, you know a, a force of centralization by the uh, you know so-called uh, evil evil mining companies. <laughs> Fair enough. The evil mining companies. It's interesting to to, to have a thought about it. it's a Bitmain and Bitfury, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Bicol, Bicol, you know, Silicon, Bitmain, Bitfury. So let's cut straight to the chase. I mean, obviously, there are different there are different tokens and cryptocurrencies that are better to mine than others, more profitable to mine than others. Uh, is your software and what you're doing? Are you, are you are you exclusively mining any one? I know you said you're Bitcoin and Ethereum. Are you also looking at you know uh, changing? Do you have something there that alerts you when it might be better to tr- to, to mine uh, Monero or Ethereum Classic? And and can you switch from one to the other relatively easy? Is that the sort of is that how you optimize the mining rigs the best or what? Uh, you can. Um, so there are there are sites out there such as uh, whattomine.com, which will um, you, you plug in the uh, characteristics of your hardware and it will tell you the most profitable um, coins to mine. And then there are services such as uh, nicehash.com where you can point your um, miners and it will effectively auto-magically direct your hashing power your processing power towards the most profitable coins and then pay you out in Bitcoin. So so there's those two those two services. And is it a day to day thing? Like it will do it so you plug in and it will change, you know, it might go from a Monero to Zcash to Ethereum and then cash out each day, week, month, I suppose you would choose it back into Bitcoin. Is that effectively how it works or is it a month by month thing or so so NiceHash does that automatically for you. Um, so you can either use that or you can do it manually, you know. In by going to checks, you know what to mine.com every day and just changing it yourself. I mean, what what we do is we um, we're a bit more strategic, and we're we're not necessarily chasing the highest profits. We're um, we're really there to support the networks and um, blockchains that we um, that that we value from a. Uh, and what are the blockchains that you value? Like, well, what are the things that you are just simply not going to sell? You're mining to hold. Yeah, so 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 we mine to hold Bitcoin and Ethereum primarily. So you're seeing a, a big future in both Bitcoin and Ethereum, and obviously that that I mean you, you're mining to support the network. I understand that, but you're also mining to well end up with more of each of those and effectively have a, have a long term gain. I would suspect. I mean, I know you are running. Uh, a fund as well, so you know you are you do have a perspective beyond just let's you know let's just look after the network. I know, I know you are a man who wants to make money at the same time. So, Bitcoin and Ethereum are the, are the two tokens that you're mining and holding somewhat permanently. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So, so we view that those as having the the biggest future. So, you know, Bitcoin is the you know store of value, um, and Ethereum is the um, programmable platform for um for everything else in the um future economy really yeah understood and look what one of the things i wanted to sort of touch on i mean it, it says i know it was a long time ago christopher but you you were involved with the act government from what was it 2009 to 2012 is that right yeah that's right i was a um also a solution architect uh in the sas which is <laughs> solution architecture services we always joked we we're always joked that we're in the sas right Oh. <laughs> which is part of um, Shared Services ICT, which is like the Shared Services Provider. Um, I bet you would have used that back in the back in your single days when you were sort of what do you do? Oh, I work in the government for the SAS. <laughs> what does that mean? Let's 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 not go into the details. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, my, my question, though, I mean, it, it comes around. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we have another new prime minister in this wonderful sunburnt nation of ours. Uh, Scott Morrison's our new PM. Thanks very much for that, everybody in Parliament. Uh, but um, I mean, I saw something that made me feel pretty good. Actually, I, it was just the other day. It came out. There was a press conference, and I think somebody in, in, within our communities in the crypto space. Uh, I saw that. I saw him actually post a, a Facebook post about this, but he basically came out and said, look, you know, ask Scott Morrison about cryptocurrencies, the future of banking, that sort of thing. And I was very impressed because Chris Morrison, sorry, Chris Morrison, Scott Morrison came out and uh, as you can tell how fresh the Prime Minister is. Well, well, they, well, they do change a lot, don't they? So, you know. 
That, oh, mate, it's, 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 it's hard. It's, it's easy to keep up with what tokens is bothering is with our prime ministers. Um, but look, he came out with a very confident answer. He didn't, he didn't give a typical political answer, which was blah, 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 ho, 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 banking. Yes. It's, you know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a BS answer. He came out with a very confident answer. The takeaway, the key takeaway I took from it was his hash, like his quotation marks, customer power and how blockchain and crypto and, and what they're pushing through at the moment, you know, he was sort of saying as treasurer and now as prime minister, was about customer power, bringing power back to the people. Now, that is primarily what cryptocurrency and crypto is about. It's about sort of avoiding sidestepping or competing with the, I suppose, you know, how we might say is the powers that be. Have you kept in contact with many people from within parliament? And um, do you have any, like, is there anybody there, is there opinion that this is a space that's competitive or is it something that they're still burying their heads in the sand? And I know you might not keep in contact with them, but do you have anything from the uh, the halls of parliament or people down in that area? I mean, you do live in that area. Yeah, I do live in Canberra. Um, so I've been speaking with um, one particular fund manager uh, who who has been down to Canberra recently and, and has a has a political lobbyist working for him as well. And, and they have been speaking directly with Treasury. And, you know, Scott Morrison used to be the Treasurer, I guess. Um, so, you know, with with the view that, you know, in, in light of the, the recent Royal Commission, that, that there does need to be a lot more transparency in the, uh, in the financial industry. Um, and, and people do need, do need the... Um, ability to see what's going on and have more control of their finances. So I think they're, they're definitely aware of all that and that the blockchain, you know, blockchain enabled finance can help solve some of those challenges. Well, there's no doubt they can't deny it any longer. I mean, look, at the end of the day, um, pol- you know, politics is, um, it's about votes. Their, their equity, their brand is votes. Without votes, you have no equity, you have no brand. Now, it's very difficult for them to cozy up too much to the banks now because the banks, uh, and I say the banks, the the big four for the most part because they're the ones that are under the scrutiny at the moment, have been basically running a monopoly and a bit of a syndicate, a bit of a cartel. Um, They've been called out. They've been found out. And there's not many days in the Australian press now that you can open the newspaper and there's not some form of grilling from one of the top four um, so the Australian public is very aware now of what has been going on, uh, what is going on, and um, you know a lot of people say ignorance is ignorance is bliss. There was a lot of happy people out there with their heads in the sand. Now they know. Now it's a powerful political tool uh, for the politicians, and that uh, customer power is. Mr. Scott Morrison puts it is definitely a, an angle for votes for them. So it's interesting to see how uh, how he answered. It's interesting to see how the um, you know the former treasurer now prime minister is talking about customer power because we know that crypto, we know that blockchain can start to bring that power back. And he also talked about innovative new technology to help this. And it, it was a very positive answer. I found it to be very positive. So, look, I want to wrap it up, Christoph. With uh, sorry, Christopher, with one one more thing. I mean, you're you're currently got your heads a, head across lots of different things. We, we covered the mining aspect of ethereal capital. Do you want to tell us a little bit? Because we spoke prior to this to recording, uh, it's it's more than just Bitcoin mining. Do you want to tell us a bit more about what you do within ethereal capital? Because just so everyone's got a, an understanding of the wide range of uh, offers that you have. Yeah, so so in ethereal capital, we we really have three separate businesses. So we've got the Hell um, Blockchain High Performance Cloud. So it's, uh, it's effectively our um, processing assets, GPUs, FPGAs, um, currently predominantly mining cryptocurrencies, but in, in the future we'll be taking on things like 3D rendering jobs, AI, AI jobs, big data processing, etc. cetera. Um, and then we've got two other businesses, one's called Black Box, HPC, so it's our high performance computing systems business. So we've we've designed, manufactured, and um, patented a uh, high performance computing server that's got up to sixteen GPUs or FPGAs in a single box um, that we 
you know, use internally in our um, HAL operation and sell to customers. So we we just started selling those to customers in July. Uh, and since July, we've sold over a million dollars worth of, um, of those machine, um, systems. Uh, and we've got another business called um, Monolith HPC, which is a um, uh, data center venture that we're in the process of setting up in New Zealand to be powered up 100% renewable energy. So our next um, our next site, you know, our next site for HAL will be expanding into that into that uh, data center by Monolith and also opening up that space to other uh, high performance computing customers and um, blockchain customers that want to locate their hardware in there as well. Well, so you've got your hands across many different areas. Um, now, I, think, I, mean, I guess the final thing is, is, is to really, you know, for people that want to find out more about yourself and Ethereal Capital, where would they find that out, Christopher? So we've, we've got a few sites. So we've got, um, actually, I, I, I did forget a couple of things that we're doing. Um, We've also got a um, effectively a, a managed, diversified crypto fund called the uh, Ethereal Capital Blockchain Infrastructure Index. So that's on the um, Iconomy Digital Asset Management Platform. You can find that um, by searching for Iconomy and BIF, which is the ticker code for it, for that fund. Um, so it's it's effectively a, a long fund that invests in various. It has a diversified crypto portfolio, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Monero, Zero X, and a whole bunch of other, whole bunch of others. Um, and then we have a, another product called the um, Hashbox T800, which is a, a password recovery system for um, you know, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, information security, penetration testers, etc. So the um, the website so uh, ethereal dot capital is is our um, primary site. Uh, Blackbox dot cat is our uh, e commerce store for our high performance computing systems. Monolith dot city is our um, site for our data center hosting business, and Economy is where our fund is uh, is run off. So economy.net all right so plenty going on in the uh in the <laughs> in the brain of of uh christopher sheather mate it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show so the guys and girls out there listening uh christopher sheather k-r-i-s-t-o-f-f-e-r sheather s-h-e-a-t-h-e-r you can find him on linkedin with links to everything that you need to know about ethereum capital what they're doing and also just thoughts and opinions so uh, hopefully everyone gets across and follows because there's a whole bunch of information that you put out there across twitter and all your other socials um thank you so much for giving us your opinion and thoughts on the space of cryptocurrency it's been an interesting conversation as it's been a different perspective and as always we want to know what's going on in the minds of everybody in the space so thanks very much for your time mate Pleasure and uh, thank you for having me. No worries. All right, guys, have a fantastic day. Bye for now. The Trader Cobb Crypto Podcast. Check out tradercobb.com because experience matters. 